were over in the book of Romans a little while ago, can you take your Bibles and turn back over there to Romans chapter number 5? Romans chapter number 5. It's a, a very familiar book to a whole lot of people. In fact, it's a very familiar chapter, passage to a whole lot of people. Uh, before we get any further, uh, any children, uh, sixth grade and under, uh, want to head back with my wife and head over for junior church, you can go ahead and just head out to the aisle and go back there. They're waiting for you in the back. You go on ahead. The rest of us are turning over to Romans chapter number five this morning. The title of my sermon this morning is Basic Introductions. That sounds like a, uh, a course, a college course, right? Basic Introductions to Nursing or Basic Introductions to uh, Ancient Greek or something like that. Uh, and no, I'm not teaching a college course this morning. Um, but I am going to be talking about something very simple this morning. Something very simple, but something very important to me. Very important to all of us as Christians. I was a teacher for 10 years down in South Florida. I graduated from Bible College in Pensacola, Florida, moved down to Fort Lauderdale, Florida, and which is like 12 hours further south into the state. It took me literally 12 hours to get from Fort Lauderdale to Pensacola, Florida, driving. Uh, but down there, I uh, taught in a Christian school for well, uh, seven years, and then I was the principal of the school for three years after that. And I learned a whole lot of lessons as a teacher, uh, and they were all hard-won lessons, hard <laughs> to fought for lessons. Uh, I mean, when you're dealing with little kids, boy, you just you learn a lot of hard lessons. Sometimes the difficult way. I remember my very first year teaching. I had 22 fifth graders in my class, and let me tell you. That was an eye-opening experience. It doesn't matter if I had a degree on the wall, <laughs> and it didn't matter if I had any classes or training. Uh, to walk into a classroom with 22 fifth graders looking at you, waiting for you to run pretty much every second of their day, and not only that, teach them, you know, the um, you know, reading, writing, and arithmetic, uh, history, science, those things that they need to learn. And then on top of that, it was a Christian school, and I was going to be a spiritual example to these kids as well. Uh, boy, that's a lot of responsibility, and it was a lot of work, and at the end of many of those days, I would put my head down on my desk and play some quiet music, and if I was a girl, I would have cried, probably. <laughs> it was exhausting, you know, uh, being a, a elementary school teacher all day long. But do you remember on your very first day of school, and, and maybe even your first day of work, uh, what the teacher would often do was your basic introductions, right? I am Mr. or Mrs. So-and-so. This is what I want you to call me. And then she would have you or he would have you introduce yourselves. What I would often do as a teacher is I would have my students, that would make a list. Can you tell me your name, tell me your age, tell me uh, what's your favorite subject or maybe your least favorite subject and your hobby or tell me your nickname or just something. You know, I'd give them a list of three or four things and then I'd go through the classroom and, you know, some kids, uh, they could not just wait to talk. And they were just, they, they could not wait to talk about themselves. That is, after all, most of our favorite subject, right? Uh, talking about ourselves. And, and they just could not wait. And then there was other kids uh, that that was their absolute worst nightmare, was having to talk in front of all the other kids in that classroom, especially on the very first day, a bunch of kids that they did not know. But why did we do it as teachers? Because we um, especially like to torture our students. Um, there may have been a little bit of that. But also, uh, we did it to help break the ice a little bit, uh, to get them talking a little bit, which we regretted later because they wouldn't stop, uh, but to get them talking a little bit, to help us to get to know one another a little bit better, and to just kind of say, this is who we are, you know, this is what we like. And then they can help find friends and, and, and things like that. You know, uh, who are we as Shenandoah Baptist Church? Well, I hate to break it to you, but we're not going to be that perfect church. If you're looking for one, you haven't found it. And I would encourage you, if you do go out there and you find the perfect church, please don't join it. You'll ruin it. I don't want you to, to go in there and just destroy everything good that they've got going. I say that tongue-in-cheek because there is no such thing as a perfect church. We are a group of saved individuals and, and saved from what? Well, we're saved from ourselves. Uh, we're safe from the consequences of ourselves, but we're far from perfect. I mean, you can just look around the room. You can look at me. You can look at each other. We're far from perfect, aren't we? We've got struggles, and we've got things that we are working on, but the difference is we have hope. I am not left to myself to sort it all out. Not even just the problems of this world, but the problems of eternity. I am not left to myself 
to sort it all out. God is going to help. We have the Word of God to help us in those areas. Maybe you're new to this church or newer to this church. Maybe you're newer to Christianity altogether. And really, what I hope what this sermon today is going to be a useful introduction to you as to what Christianity is. But really, I want to introduce you to two individuals this morning. One is yourself, and two is Jesus Christ. And so this morning, the first thing I want to look at is who we are. You say, preacher, what do you know more about me than I know about myself? Isn't that kind of prideful or presumptive or even arrogant of you to think that you know something more about me than I know about myself? Well, I may not know your favorite foods. I may not know much about your history, your past. I may not know very much about, in fact, I might not even know your name just because you told me it uh, five minutes ago does not mean that I remember it. However, there are some things that I do know that are applicable across the playing field to all of us. Who are we? Well, I want you to look at Romans chapter number five again. Romans chapter number five in your Bibles, and we're going to look into this passage a little bit. This passage, you saw, you know, there was two sides, and, and I, I like the passages where there's a dichotomy, where you've got this on one side, but, or instead, this other thing on the other side. And we have two people being compared here in, the, in Romans chapter number five. We have um, Adam being talked about, and then we have Jesus Christ being talked about. If you know the story of Adam and Eve back in the beginning of Genesis, the first two created people that God formed and breathed life into because we believe as Christians that God created everything that we see and that God created mankind. It takes a whole lot more faith. And remember, faith is believing into something that you cannot see, something you cannot test or experiment on, something you cannot observe or witness. It takes a whole lot more faith for me to believe that man is a cosmic accident than it does to believe that there is somebody out there, a great designer who created us and designed our eyes, which is impossible for it to have come. I mean, a one in probably 30 trillion chance in everything we see around us today happening by pure accident. That takes an awful lot of faith to believe. And it takes even more faith to believe that life even the most simplest form, a single cell amoeba, comes from non-life. You see, we have never in the existence of man observed, scientifically observed and recorded, life coming from non-life. Because it is a scientific impossibility. So then where did life come from? Even if you believed in the Big Bang Theory, even if you believe that at one point, way back, however many billions or trillions of years, that there was all of the mass and all of the energy in the entire universe all combined into a small, however big, some people say a dot on a page, some people make it bigger. Where did even that energy come from? Where did the matter come from that is, that is all inside that little ball that eventually exploded, becoming what we are now? What I'm talking about this morning is real-life answers to purpose in life. Because I believe that we as man have a purpose. I believe that you were created not just to grow food in the soil and fill your belly, that you were created not just to work a job, that you were created not just to have fun on the boat or to sit on the couch and veg out watching TV or reruns. I believe that you and I were created by God for a specific purpose. Amen. Now, what was that purpose? Well, that's between you and the Lord. I do know some things that, he had, that you were created for. We originally were created to fellowship with God. We were created to walk and to talk with Him. That's what Adam and Eve were created in the garden to do. But God didn't want a bunch of automatons walking around, robots that did everything that He said to do. And so He gave them a choice. He says, I want you to love me. I want you to desire me. But you have to have a choice. I've given you a perfect place. I have given you, um, you know, eternal life at that particular point in time. You, there's no pain. There's no trouble. There's no sorrow. And so I will introduce for you a choice. Here is a tree. And you are not allowed to eat of the fruit of this tree, which one might think, well, that's easy. Just don't eat of the fruit of that tree. Eat everything else and life's going to be great. But they didn't understand all that. 
never experienced loss. They had never experienced disappointment. They had never experienced shame. How many of us have experienced those things? Yeah. We understand from our perspective now what it is like. Adam and Eve did not have that perspective yet. And so Eve was tricked into taking that apple because she thought she was going to gain some new insight and some new knowledge that only God has and that now she could then have. But it wasn't what she thought it was, was it? Oh, she got some new insight, all right. And you and I are paying for it. And our children will pay for it. Who are we? We are created beings. We are not cosmic accidents. But you know who else we are? The book of Genesis tells us that we are created in the image of God. Now, some people will say, well, that does not mean necessarily that we look like God looks. Because remember, God is a spirit doesn't have that physical body. Now, Jesus Christ has that physical body, but the Bible tells us that God is a spirit, but we are created in the image of God. He created us in some ways like Him. We have the body and the soul and the spirit. The body, which is this outward mechanics, this flesh, this biological form that we wear for a time period that, that gets weaker and it, that it devolves and eventually turns into dust and stops operating. We have the mind, that which, you know, controls the operational center of our body, that which we think and that which we feel. But then we also have that eternal part of us known as the soul. Now, you're not going to be able to look on a chart in a biology book and find exactly where the soul is located. The soul was the part of us that goes on and lives for an eternity because we were made to be eternal beings. But because of sin comes death. We are created in the image of God. But understand this too. And I really want to emphasize this point. We are loved and desired by God. Sometimes preachers and churches get a bad rap that they're all talking about sin and it's all about, you know, thou shalt not do this and thou shalt not do this and everybody's bad and the world's bad and, you know, and they, they, you know, they, they think that that's all we ever talk about and that's all that is important. Understand this. There are other churches that like to talk about the love of God a lot. And the love of God is great. The love of God is perfect. The love of God is the whole reason you and I are even here in this room this morning. But understand this. Why did God have to go to such extremes to send His only begotten Son down to this earth to die for our sins, if not for His extreme love that He has for us? You see, who are we? We are God's creation. We are created in His image. We are loved and we are desired by God. But we are a fallen race. You know what the law of entropy is? The law of entropy flies in the face of evolution because the law of entropy states that everything is getting worse and de-evolving and degenerating. You just look at human DNA. Human DNA, generation after generation after generation, is getting worse and worse, more disease, more uh, virus, more problems, uh, because human DNA is devolving in a sense. This flies in the face of what uh, modern day quote unquote science teaches us in evolution, but understand this, not, just even outside of the science for a second, we are a fallen people. You know what I, I had to teach my kids as they're growing up? I have to teach them to not be selfish. Any, any parents here had to teach their children to not be selfish? How did it go? <laughs> I want to know. Does it get any better? <laughs> and, and, and you know what I didn't have to teach my kids? I didn't have to teach them how to be selfish. I never had to teach them to lie, to try to, try to cover up something they've done they shouldn't have done. I never had to teach them all the perfect places to hide candy wrappers in the house so that mom and dad don't find them. But when we do, man, we find a stash of candy wrap, empty candy wrappers, let me might add there on that one. Anybody had to teach their children how to do that? Dads maybe, but probably not, no. We, we, didn't, we didn't teach our children to steal. We didn't teach our children to want themselves first and above everybody else. We didn't teach our children to lie. We didn't teach our children to get mad and spit and kick and bite and throw things. That all came very natural to them. What we spend the first 18 years of their life and even beyond doing 
is trying to train that stuff out of them. To help them to learn to control their bad habits, to control their natural tendencies. Just because something's natural does not make it okay. We teach them to control their natural tendencies, to keep them in the way, in where they ought to be. But I tell you what, this is who we are as a human race. We're a fallen people. But that leaves us with a problem. It leaves us with a problem. Revelation 21, verse number 27 tells us that heaven is perfect and that, thou, that anything that defileth or worketh an abomination or even maketh a lie shall enter into heaven. It leaves us with a problem. Who are we? Well, we are created beings. But we chose sin. Look at verse number 12 in Romans 5. It says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world. Who was that one man? Adam. Because of one man, Adam, sin entered into the world and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men for that all have sinned. Here we go. This has been written thousands of years. Even thousands of years before this was written was Adam and Eve. And because of Adam, which he is our ancestor, because of Adam, sin reigns generation after generation, and so you were born with a sin nature. You don't want to hear me talk about sin? You want to hear me talk about the love of God? I would love to tell you about the love of God. And I'm going to get to that here in just a second. Not only who are we, but number two, what did we do? What did we do? I go back here to Romans uh, 5, 12. He says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. For until the law was in the world, for until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed or stamped on when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. What did we do? You know, Romans 3, if you just turn back a page or two, Romans 3.10 says this, As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. You see, as a Christian, I'm not better than anybody else. Look what it said back in verse number 9 of Romans 3. What then? Are we better than they? No, in no wise. For we have before proved, both Jews and Gentiles, that they are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous. No, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. Look again in verse number 23 here. It says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We are born with this sin nature, and we have broken the commandments of God. You say, well, what commandments have I broken, preacher? We could easily go through the commandments and find some, but if I were to say, are, are, how many of you have, have murdered before? Any raise of hands? i got the sheriff's phone number. I'll call him if I need to, I guess. No, no takers on the whole murder thing? You might have, though. Because the Bible says that if you hate somebody in your heart, that in God's eyes, you've already murdered them. How many of you have ever committed adultery? Now, don't raise your hand, please. <laughs> I don't, I don't want to know. <laughs> but the Bible says, if you've looked upon a woman to lust after her in your heart, in God's eyes, you're already guilty of adultery. I'm not saying this to be condemning anybody because you know what? I'm a man. I'm not perfect. I can't say that I don't struggle in any area in life. No, I don't want to excuse it. I certainly cannot excuse it at all. And you know what? We all have sin and we all have temptation in our lives that we struggle with and that we battle with and many times we're victorious over and sometimes we lose to it. That is not an excuse. That does not make it okay. But I want us to all understand that we have all broken commandments. What about thou shalt not bear false witness? Well, I've not broken any of the Ten Commandments. Have you ever lied? Well, yeah, when I was like 10, it was my sister's bubble gum, you know, and I stole it and then I lied about it. Or 
Maybe even it was last week, you know. Yeah, I've lied. The Bible says if you've broken one commandment, you are guilty of all of them. You say, preacher, this is awfully condemning. This is awfully, you know, talking about sin and telling us we're bad. The Bible also reminds us that even our own righteousness is as a filthy rag before God. We just studied that last Wednesday night in Isaiah 64. What does that mean? There's a lot of very religious people around the world that do a lot of very religious things. Is that enough? Is that good enough? My righteousness, the best that I can produce, is that good enough? The Bible says that our righteousness is as a filthy rag before God. That term filthy rag, I'm not going to tell you exactly what it means. You can go back and listen to it on Wednesday night because it's not a pleasant thing to talk about, especially in, in mixed company. But a filthy rag is something you don't want to touch. It's something you want to throw away and never want to see it again. That's the best I can produce. It doesn't meet God's standards. That's why in Romans 3.23, like we just read, we have all come short of the glory of God. I read a saying, it says this, the law was too late to prevent sin and death, and it is too weak to save from sin and death. The law was to be a stumbling block so that we knew just how humble and weak we actually are. You see, when Moses went up on the Mount Sinai and God put the, the Ten Commandments on that stone tablet, was, were the Jews supposed to keep every single one of those Ten Commandments in order to be perfect, in order to be right before God? It was an impossibility. No, a single man could do that. Nobody could keep the Ten Commandments perfectly. That's why the Scripture tells us that we're all sinners. So then what was the purpose of the law? The purpose of the law was to make sin so evident that they could not deny that they did wrong things. Well, why in the world would God want everybody to know that they were doing wrong things? So that they would look to Him. So that they would look to Him for redemption. So that they would look to Him for righteousness. So that they would look to Him for help. And all throughout the Old Testament... The, the scriptures throughout the Old Testament teach us about sacrifices in the temple and in the tabernacle over in Jerusalem. And they would bring in the lamb or a turtle dove or a goat. And they would bring in the bullocks and they would offer these sacrifices and shed that blood. And that blood would get taken into the temple, into the Holy of Holies. The holiest place in that temple where only one man could go one time a year, the high priest. And he would take that blood and sprinkle it there on the Ark of the Covenant between the two seraphims in a place called the mercy seat. And that sprinkling of that blood was for the atonement, the payment for the sin of Israel for that year. Was that the, the be-all, end-all of forgiveness of sins? No. It was just a shadow. It was just a shadow of something very important that was going to be coming. And that is Jesus Christ. Who is Jesus. I want you to turn over to John chapter number one. John chapter number one. You see, God understood. He made a creation. He created us. And he gave us a choice on whether or not we were going to obey and follow him or choose to follow our own hearts. And it's a very dangerous thing for us to follow our own hearts because the Bible says that our hearts are desperately wicked. If we follow our own hearts, our hearts are going to change day after day, month after month, year after year. And my heart may not desire what God desires for my life. My heart may desire what my flesh desires, and it may not be good for me. The Bible in nowhere tells us to follow our hearts, but it tells us to follow truth. It tells us to follow obedience, to follow God in obedience. And God looked and he saw the trouble that we were in. You see, this is the love of God. You say, I want a church that just tells me about love. I want a church that just tells me how good God is. How can I tell you about how good God is if I cannot tell you about why he had to send Jesus Christ? If I cannot tell you about the whole purpose of the cross, about the whole purpose of the, the painful and the shameful shedding of blood that he had to go through upon that cross. And that purpose was you. That purpose was me. Because no amount of religion, no amount of saying words or praying over beads or crawling on my knees or anything, no amount of religion is going to get me to heaven or make me be at peace with God. Only one thing is going to bring about peace 
between me and God, and it has nothing to do with money, and it has nothing to do with my goodness or my righteousness. It is the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Who is Jesus? You're in John chapter 1. Look what it says. In John 1, 1, it says, In the beginning, that means when the beginning began, he was already there. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. If you're using a King James version of the Bible, you will notice that Word is capitalized. You will notice that God is capitalized at the end of verse number 1. There is a version of Scripture that changes it, lowercases those W's, and says at the end of verse 1 that the word was A, lowercase g, God. Can you believe that? They're taking away the deity of Jesus Christ. Go and look what else it says. The same, the word, which is Jesus, was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, Jesus. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him, Jesus was life. And the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. And then it begins to talk about John the Baptist for a little bit, but I want you to look at verse number 14 now. Just in case you weren't sure who the Word was in verses 1 and 2, it tells us in verse number 14, And the Word was made flesh, was born, and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The Word is Jesus Christ. Who is He? He's not the good twin of Lucifer, like some might teach. He is not a created being, but He is the Creator. He is not an angel, but He is above the angels because the angels worshipped Him. He is the Creator. He is eternal. He is all-knowing and He is all-powerful. He is God the Son. We know that He is God because of the names that Scripture gives Him. We know because He identifies Himself as God. We know because of what He did. He created. He sustained life. He forgave sins. He gifted eternal life. We know He is God because He was worshipped as God. He accepted worship as God. We also know Jesus is God because of His divine characteristics. Hey, if you want to know more about that, is Jesus God and how do we know? There's a series of videos on our church website. You go to the Watch Now tab and scroll to the bottom, and there's a series of short videos there talking about just that very thing. Who else is Jesus? He is the mediator between God and man. You see, in the Old Testament, they needed a priest to go in and to offer those sacrifices. We don't need that anymore. When Jesus died on the cross, that veil, that thick curtain between the Holy of Holies and the Holy Place tore in half from top to bottom, the Bible says. No longer do we need a priest to go on our behalf to God. The Bible says that now we are like those priests. We can go before the throne of God. We can seek forgiveness of sins. We can go and take our cares and our concerns and our worries to Him. But we also have a mediator, the only mediator, the Bible says, between God and man. There is no man, no priest, no white collar that can go to God for me. He can only go to God for his own sins. But I can go before God for mine. Jesus Christ is that mediator. But you know what else he really is? He is love. He is love. Do you think you know what love is? Anybody in here like the Hallmark Channel? Any men? Didn't think so. <laughs> you've seen one Hallmark movie, you've seen them all, right? Anyways, I'm not going to dwell on that. Uh, Hallmark movies, you know, they're all lovey-dovey, and it's always these, you know, perfect situations. And you know that how they end. It's when they decide that they're going to be a couple, or maybe they get married, and then you don't know what happens after that right? Because that would make very good, um, a very good Hallmark movie. It would make a, a more of a, a Dr. Phil session, maybe, <laughs> the things that happen after they get married, because it isn't quite so rosy after that all the time now, is it? Um, but we're not going to talk about that either right now. What is real love, though? Well, I can tell you love is not a feeling, because that feeling comes and goes, right? Men, ladies, that feeling comes and goes. Real love is a decision, is a decision. When you stood there at the altar, when you were getting married, you made a determination. This is the person to whom I am going to give my love for the rest of my life for goodness, 
for worse, for richer, for poorer, for in sickness and in health, whether things are great and whether we have lots of money and whether everybody's healthy or things are terrible <laughs> and we don't have any money and everybody's sick and we're just not getting along well, you, you made that promise, that covenant at the beginning. It is a choice. I'm choosing that even when the feeling's not there, I'm still going to love this person. Jesus made a determination. He made a choice. I don't know exactly how it went in heaven between God and the Holy Spirit and God the Son, but they made a determination that mankind was lost and that they were going to lose mankind altogether if they didn't step in and do something. Because they understood something. They understood that I, in and of myself, can do nothing to change my sin nature. And so they had to step in and do it. Jesus Christ came over 2,000 years ago to be that perfect sacrifice. He was born, we celebrate that at Christmas. He was born for the sole reason of dying on that cross. He was not born to be the king of Jerusalem. He was not born to raise a revolutionary army and overthrow Rome. That's what the Jews were hoping he was going to do. But that's not it. He was born for the sole reason of dying on that cross. Well, why? Because he's love. Because he saw your need. He saw your plight. Even if you don't recognize it, he saw that after your last breath, you go into eternity. To one of two places. To heaven and fellowship and relationship with him for an eternity or to hell for an eternity. Because you see, there's only one way to pay for my own sin. According to the Word of God and according to God Himself, who is the holy and just judge, who must judge sin. There's only one way to atone for it myself, and that is an eternity in the lake of fire. But God is love, and Jesus is love. And this is why He subjected Himself to the pain and the torture of the cross so that I don't have to pay for my own sins. This is the message of the gospel. This is the message of salvation. This is the message of love. That Jesus died so I don't have to. That Jesus, as He hung upon that cross, my sin, not just my, my one sin, but my mountain of sins that I have committed and I have yet to commit, He bore the guilt of that sin, He bore the shame of that sin, and He bore the eternal penalty of that sin on His shoulders. But it wasn't just mine. It was yours too. Because He knew I couldn't do it. I couldn't bear it. I couldn't pay for it. And so He willingly gave Himself to do that for us. The Bible says this, the wages of sin is death. What we earn for our sin is death, physical death, but spiritual death too, as we go into the eternity, into the lake of fire. But it says after that, but the gift of God. Notice that term gift. It means you don't have to give money to the church. You don't have to make the preacher fat and rich. You don't have to do things. You don't have to crawl. You don't have to say a thousand prayers. It's a gift, a free gift. The gift of God is what? Eternal life through how? How do I get that? Through Jesus Christ our Lord, the Bible says. Who is Jesus? He is love. What did Jesus do? He subjected himself to the humiliation of becoming a man. He grew up in a humble, but yet a godly home. When he began his ministry, he had to go and seek out his own followers. He had no home to call his own. He had no church. He had no cathedral to deliver his messages in, except for the cathedral that he had built himself surrounding the towns and the villages of Israel. He didn't receive honors from the king or from the leaders of the land. Instead, he was hunted. He was lied about. He was falsely imprisoned. He was put through a sham trial. And then he was beaten and he was tortured, not for any fault of his own, but because of mine. The Old Testament told us that that was going to happen. The Jews were supposed to have known that this is what was going to happen to Jesus, the Messiah, when he came. In Isaiah 53, they're told that he would be despised and rejected of men. He would be a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. 
Surely He hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows on that cross, yet we did esteem Him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted, but He was wounded. Why? For our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon Him, and with His stripes, that is the whip that went across His back, we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray and have turned everyone to His own way. You see, Jesus was sinless. He had to be sinless to be the perfect Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. He didn't bear His own guilt and punishment of His own sins on the cross. He wore mine. Christ died for the ungodly. Paul talks about in Romans 3.25, he talks about that substitutionary atonement. A term that he uses there called propitiation. What that really means is this, that he put himself on that cross in my place. That is true love. The Bible says, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man would give his life for his brother. That's the greatest form of love. And Jesus Christ is the greatest example of that. You may speak here this morning and you say, Preacher, I'm one of the worst in the world. Well, guess what? Christ died for the worst in the world. The Apostle Paul was a murderer. He hunted down and persecuted Christians and threw them in jail. Whole families. And yet God got a hold of that man, saved him, turned his life around completely and made him one of the foremost preachers of the gospel to the very same people that he was hunting down years before. You might say, but I have no power to be better. Well, Christ died for those that were without strength. But my case, it condemns itself. Well, Christ died for those that are condemned. You say, but my case is hopeless. Well, Christ died for the hopeless. He is the hope of the hopeless. He is the Savior, not just of the a little bit lost. He is the Savior of the completely lost. You see, there is no road that you could have gone down so far that Christ cannot bring you back and save you. There is no pit that you could have dug yourself down in so deep that He was not there first and that He cannot bring you up out of it. He is the Savior of all of mankind. It's never too late, and you've never gone too far. There is no sin amount that is too great that it was not enough. God can save you. Maybe you're here this morning and you don't know 100% for sure that you're saved. Today can be the day of salvation. Over in uh, Romans 5 again, we see where he says, I'll find the right verse here. In verse number 16, And not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. For the judgment was by one to condemnation. To condemnation. Or, in the rest of the verse, but the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. We know what condemnation is being declared guilty. But justification is being declared innocent. Not that I have not sinned, but somebody else took that sin for me, took the punishment for that sin, and I don't have to bear it any longer. The outcome of this choice, you choose Adam or you choose Jesus, it means everything. If you choose Adam, you receive judgment and condemnation. If you choose yourself, this is what you choose. But if you choose Jesus Christ you'll receive the free gift of God's grace. Grace is being given favor that you did not deserve or earn. And you receive God's mercy. And that mercy is not getting what you did deserve, the punishment that you did deserve. Salvation is not about what I can do for God. It's not what I can do for the church. It's not about what I can do for myself. It's not about me at all. The gospel and salvation is about what He has already freely done for me and my choosing to believe, my choosing to trust in what Jesus Christ did on that cross to save me from my sins and the penalty of my sins so that I can spend an eternity in heaven. So who are we? Well, I may not know you very well, but the Bible does tell us some things about ourselves that we don't really want to hear. Who are we? Well, we're sinners. Who am I? I'm a sinner saved by the grace of God. 
Who are you? Have you been saved by the grace of God? Has there been that one time in your life where you've accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? Where you've placed your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ? I'm not asking if you're religious. I'm not asking if you've been baptized. I'm not asking if you go to church. I'm asking, was there that one time in your life where you knelt down before God and you confessed your sins before Him and you chose to place your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ to save you from your sins? Was there that one time in your life? Do you know for sure you're on your way to heaven? The Bible says, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life. That ye may know that ye have eternal life. You see, you can know you're on your way to heaven, and not because you're a good person, and not because you're baptized, or because you go to church, but because of what Jesus Christ did. And His blood is effective enough to save me from all my sins including the ones I'm going to do tomorrow and next year. His blood is that powerful to save me from my sins. Maybe you're here this morning and you don't know 100% for sure you're saved, or maybe you know for sure you're not. Would you let today be the day of salvation? Would you choose to believe in what Christ Jesus did on that cross for you? Let's all bow our heads and close our eyes.